It is uh, my pleasure to introduce to you today uh, Dr. Timothy Harthorn. Uh, he is a professor at Central Michigan University, and he did his undergraduate work at Grinnell College, his master's at Colgate, and his doctorate is from the University of Texas at Austin. So <laughs> please welcome today's speaker. Thank you. Is, is this volume okay? Is it too much, too little? Okay, good. I'm a little deaf, so I always get mad when people say, well, I'll just talk loudly because I still can't hear them. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be here, I'm, not just because I'm really happy to be here, but also because I could get here. Um, <laughs> you know, CMU was closed yesterday, and um, the roads were people going 40 miles an hour when you really could go 55, and I'm getting behind them, and I get that. Uh, but I made it. Yay. Um, so I'm really happy, too, to be able to talk about charge syndrome. It's a... Uh, a little bit of a passion for me, and I'm sure it is for you too, right? Because everybody knows all about charge here, right? No, probably not. Um, so instead of what you need to know, you really don't need to know anything about it. But I think it's a lot of really cool information to learn something about a syndrome. You know, there are lots and lots of genetic syndromes out there, probably a good thousand of them. Um, most of them we don't know a whole lot about because you have like two or three people in the world that have it. Um, but there are others, you know, of course, Down syndrome. Most people know something about Down syndrome. Maybe Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, there are others, cool ones like Crude de Shock, where they cry like a cat. Um, so charge is you know, among, among those. Um, that's a picture of my son, who, Jacob, who has charge syndrome, and was the whole reason why I got into looking at charge. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself here. So professor of psychology with the school psychology graduate program. We have a APA accredited doctoral program and also the NASP approved specialist program. Anybody thinking about school psychology you might want to look us up. Um, I've been at Central for 30 years. I've been there for a while. Every state in the country is eligible to have a deaf blind project. It's funded by the federal government, Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. And I've had the project at, at Central Michigan since 1999. So we serve the entire state of Michigan. Um, for children and youth who are deafblind, providing consultative services to schools, support to families. Um, I never thought that deafblindness was going to be something that I would spend my life really heavily involved with, but CHARGE syndrome turns out to be the leading cause of congenital deafblindness. People born with deafblindness for a specific reason. Um, the most common one is CHARGE. And I'm also director of the CHARGE syndrome research lab, and there are some of my students from the lab. Um, looking very appropriate. We have lab parties a couple times a year, and that's at one of our lab parties, and it was held at my house, and that's why they're so cheerful. I have a combination. There are like four doctoral students there, and then there's undergraduates as well, each one with their own project. Um, so lots and lots of research being done out of the lab. OK, the true author of everything that I know, it says do, but it's also everything I know I've learned from my son Jacob. Uh, his big picture over there on your left, um, fairly recent picture. Jacob is 29. He lives in the house next door to us. He has 24-7 caregivers. They're all college students who take like four-hour shifts. So they're in and out there a lot until they graduate, unless I can keep them from graduating, which uh, I can't really do. I threaten it a lot. I mean, call your professor and fail you, and then you can't graduate. Stay working with Jacob. Um, so he has actually a really good life. Now, charge is highly variable, which I'll talk about in a moment. Jacob's kind of at the low end of performance in charge syndrome, but he does pretty well. There's a picture of my wife holding him when he was quite little. The first four years, the charge is keeping them alive. And then that's a number of years later, but still a fairly old picture of me holding him. This is why he's got such a great life. If you look up there at the top, those two of his caregivers are out in, out in the town with him. I mean, that's, that's fun, right? So here are pictures of some kids with CHARGE syndrome. Um, and I just put this together several years ago just to have something to kind of show the variety. That you, I love that picture in the middle. One of my doctoral students took that in Australia at one of the conferences there. And I've known three of those girls at least for a long time. They're all 19, 20 now and doing really well. Girl on the upper left, she passed away in her early 20s, just didn't wake up one morning. 
and Tommy there too had a heart condition and he passed away. But the others are, this is my son Jacob right there in the middle. Um, Michael has the, has the um, tracheostomy, uh, severe behavioral issues. My gosh, he was a mess. But I think he's doing much better today. Um, there is a book, if you get really interested in charge syndrome, so we wrote a book, it came out in 2011. But we're working on a second edition, so if you want to wait another year or so, we may have the second edition out in a year or so, that's the plan. There's also, for those of you who speak German, there's a German book. Um, those are kind of the main two books on charge syndrome that have, have, have been done. There's really not a, lots of articles, especially genetic articles, but in terms of publications and in terms of books, that's, those are the two. I just wanted to give you a sense of, of some of the variability. So this is Ruben from a number of years ago. Ruben is now acting on stage and he's in commercials, I believe. But when his mom first gave me a description of Ruben at this age, I'll have to read it over here. Two open heart surgeries, Tetralogy of Fallot, that's a major heart condition. VSD, ASD, also holes in the heart, repaired at three months, and scar tissue removed to five years. Moderate severe mixed hearing loss, whereas a Baja, that's a bone conduction hearing aid that's anchored to the top of the skull and, and it's using the skull as a resonant board essentially to pick up sound. Coloboma, which I'll define, wears glasses, had a trach uh, from three months to three years due to failed extubation from laryngomalacia, so problems with the back of your throat swallowing and scarred airway, 19 surgeries to date, mainstreamed education, started reading age three after signing from age one, now only speaks and doesn't like to sign, classically trained, training in piano, and also plays by ear. Big issue has always been his airway. Speech is very good with only a slight impediment with letter R. Receives speech, PT, OT, adaptive therapy, enjoys skiing, swimming, and karate, challenges with balance. So, you know, when you start looking at all the medical kinds of stuff, to some of these kids, many of the kids have, you wonder how in the world do they function? But it turns out that most everything, there's a way to correct it, there's a way to deal with it. Um, and so we're really working to get these kids through the medical phases into, a, into school, help them to survive school, and then go on with their lives. So I said, a high degree of variability in charge. So just to so this one here, Cynthia is a school psychologist. She works in Boston. Um, didn't know she had charge until her son was born and he was diagnosed right away and they figured, of course, that's what she has too. Um, that's my son Jacob again. So he went to school until he was 26. So we actually got a certificate and he went to school and not quite the same thing as having a graduate degree. But that's just to illustrate what a range of ability that you, you see with charge. It's very difficult to talk about typical charge because so many different kinds of things can vary in severity or, or not. So, no average charge. That's from uh, Surface Paradise in Australia. I go to their conference every other year. And by the way, charge is about 50-50 male-female, but this just happened to be a bunch of the girls. But even among the girls, there's a huge degree of variability. Um, the one at the top up there, 19, about so high, um, she, she, her speech is so hard to understand. It's not just the Australian accent, I can do that all right. But her speech is so hard to understand. Other things are doing really well for her. So it's just it's so much variability that you have to deal with. So they can be completely deaf or even occasionally have nearly normal hearing. I'm not sure I've met a kid with charge who had no hearing impairments, but I've heard of one. So that's a possibility. Blind, completely blind to normal sight. Although the normal sight is not entirely normal. I'll explain this when I talk about colobomas in a little bit here, but um, basically acuity can be normal in both eyes. Severe heart condition to normal heart. My son had a little ASD, so a little hole uh, in the heart, but as he grew, it closed. So. That was not a big problem for him. They may be fed by gastrostomy tube right into their stomach or can have normal eating. Good communication or limited communication. Very intelligent to intellectual disability. Good motor skills to mostly wheelchair. 
Very few kids are mostly wheelchair with charge, but I know one, she can walk, she just prefers not to, and I'm not sure. Sometimes I think we should just make her walk more, but I don't. She lives in Australia, so I don't get a chance to go over there and bug her too often. Okay. I want to say something about our, our template here. So you can see the, the drawing over here. We were at the German conference in 2016 and went down to Heidelberg afterwards to stay with a family who has a kid with charge. Who's right there in the middle, Lavinia. And Lavinia's mom brought out these sketchbooks of Lavinia's drawings. And we were just blown away by how much we enjoyed them. So, Lavinia, how about doing a logo for our charge lab? So that's what she came up with. And um, my students like to point out, Tim, it's not plugged in. <laughs> I don't know if that was a message from Lavinia that I, we're not plugged in, but I don't know. I don't think so. That's two of my, my doctoral students. And we also have Charge Lab t-shirts with the same logo on it. I mean, we're, we're cool, right? Um, but Lavinia is cool. OK, so what is Charge? So a genetic syndrome, all right? And you know, we didn't know for sure it was genetic until 2004. We suspected that it was. But you know, sometimes finding a gene for some of these conditions is extremely difficult, especially when it's a specific gene, not a chromosome. And if you're missing part of a chromosome, okay, that's, we can spot those things. But this was not, this is a specific gene. Um, I don't have the name of it up there, but yeah, it doesn't, CHD7 is not that, that important, but um, occurs in about one in 15,000 births. That's a guess. People say, well, how common is it? Well, one of my friends did a study in Canada and found it like one in 8,500. Whoa, this is really common. Then another friend did a study in Australia. It was like in one in 35,000. I don't know. I started just telling people I thought it was one in 10, and that got cited all over the place. I just made it up. Um, but then there was a, a study done in the Netherlands, and you can pretty much identify everybody in the Netherlands as a small country who's got charge. And that's where the 1 in 15, they said it was two 1 in 15 and 1 in 17. So I, I decided to do the low end. So I always tell people it's about 1 in 15,000 births. But we don't really know for sure. But that puts it kind of in the middle range with um, some of the other genetic syndromes. They're about that, about that range. CHARGE, we love, we love the name, but it's an acronym. C-H-A-R-G-E. Each one stands for something. And this came about from a bunch of geneticists back in 1980, sitting around a table thinking, what are we going to call this thing that's just been identified? It was in the literature in 79 and in two independent studies, actually. They didn't call it charge at that point. They just said, look, we've been going through our records, and we see that we have a bunch of kids that we work with at our, at our hospital who have similar kinds of manifestation of these different anomalies that seem to be going together. So the geneticists were impressed and decided to come up with something. And I talked to one of them who said, I don't remember who came up with charge, but some, one of them did. And it's kind of stayed that way ever since. Even though we get suggestions from time to time, we should call it the hall Hitner syndrome or something else. And no, people, it's going to be called charge. The families have adopted that, and you know, there's no going back on it. But as I said, it was just a bunch of anomalies that went together. So what's the cause? We didn't know the cause for sure. So it's called charge association, that these anomalies can, were associated with one another uh, to a greater extent than you would expect by chance. But we saw hints that it was probably really genetic. And so it was in, in nine, 2004 when a team in, in the Netherlands uh, actually found the gene. Uh, which I thought was so cool that it was the Netherlands that found it because other places were looking for it. Paris was looking for it. Houston, Texas was looking for it. Nah, nah. You know, the, the, the Dutch found it. And, and the people who found it become close friends. And so I'm, I'm really happy that they found it. We don't use the acronym for diagnostic purposes. You know, when you first identify a new condition, what do you see? You see the more severe cases, right? 
And as you begin to get familiar with it, you start saying, whoa, there's a huge range here. Maybe the C-H-A-R-G-E is not really a great way to diagnose it. Maybe there are other ways. There have been a lot of different models for the best way to diagnose it as a clinical diagnosis. But, um, but we still have to talk about the C-H-A-R-G-E because that's charge. Why did charge come from? Um, okay, as I said before, a major cause of congenital deaf blindness, if you look at the known causes, it's the most common cause. Um, that's where, you know, originally when charge, because there's so many other kinds of disabilities came along, the deafblind community didn't really want them because, no, you've got more than just deafblindness. And there's some people that don't recognize because of all the other kinds of problems that people have that, remember, they're both visually and hearing impaired. This is deafblindness? Oh, never thought about that. Um, but we're getting much better about that, recognizing that when you have this dual sensory impairment, it really handicaps you tremendously. So it's been very important to associate with the deafblind community, and they've gotten used to us. Not all individuals who are diagnosed will have all the different characteristics, and that also makes the diagnosis more difficult. Yes, there's a genetic test, but um, maybe my next slide, or maybe not. But, only about 70% of the kids who are clinically diagnosed with CHARGE will test positive for the gene. There's, that's been kind of a big mystery since 2004. There's a team that thinks they've identified a different gene which impacts the gene we already knew about and can help explain where the other 30% are. Um, I'm excited to see whether that develops uh, reliably. But as I said, each of the nominees can vary in, in degree of severity. Oh, the CHD7 gene. There's Connie Van Ravenschweiz, the person who, who found the gene, who's her team. Um, she saw in literature that there's a missing piece of chromosome 8 in some cases with charge, so she decided to look more closely at that part of chromosome 8, and she, that's where she found the CHD7. Uh, so the seventh, seventh gene within the family of chromodomain genes to be found, that's why it's a CHD7. There is now a CHD8. I'm not sure they've gone to nine yet, but eight really doesn't seem to be too impacted with charge. It's seven. About 70% test positive, but if they meet the Blake criteria, which are not the CHARGE, but I'll show them to you in a little bit, um, about 90% are actually positive. De novo, de novo means a spontaneous mutation. It wasn't inherited. Something goes wrong in the egg or the sperm, and we know that likely in every single case is something wrong with the sperm, which I thought was extremely funny when I found that out. And I discovered in speaking to audiences with parents and saying, hey guys, it's us. Then not everybody was pleased. I th you know, we, we spend so much time blaming our wives, right? And the mothers, it's all their fault, what they do. <laughs> but it turns out it's us. But it's not, we didn't do anything, right? Men reproduce sperm all their lives. And every time you reproduce from the original cells, you get little errors that crop in. Have you ever taken like a, some, something was written and you make a Xerox copy of it, and then you take the copy, you make a copy of that, and take a copy, and, make, and little errors kind of creep in along the way? It's the same kind of principle, that the more often you reproduce something, the greater the chance that there's a problem with it. And for charge, we already knew that fathers tended to be older than average for having a, having a child. So, not a, some fathers, but I was young when I had my kid with charge. Yeah, I know, but on average, you know, the older you get, the more likely you are to have an error in your sperm. You know, probably everybody in this room has some genetic anomaly. You know, we all do. It's just most of them don't make any difference whatsoever. It just turns out this one does. And so that's why it's so important. Um, so, a copy here in the sperm. That, for those of you that like genetics and want to know exactly where the, where the gene is, there's a nice picture. So, transmission. So, as I say, most cases is due to de novo mutation of the gene. It's a spontaneous mutation. In these cases, the parents don't have the gene mutation, right? The siblings don't have the gene mutation. But the risk of a second child with charge is a little bit higher than typically. So 
I've heard geneticists say, well, you've got about 1% chance of having a kid with charge. If you've already had one, you're probably up at 2%, right? There's actually a family here in Grand Rapids who's got two kids with charge, and they're both de novo, so they got the short end of the stick. But uh, yeah, they're all doing fine. Uh, in fact, that's, that's the family, so I probably shouldn't have had that here because someone might know them and I'm disclosing something about them, but great family. I love them. They're, actually, we've been good friends for a long time. In some cases, if the parent has the kid, like with Cynthia, and there's Cynthia with Brady from a few years ago, um, and she's, Tim, use my picture anytime you want, so I do. Uh, then you got a 50% chance of having a kid with charge, right? So, but that's probably not a lot because for a kid who has charge to grow up and be able to reproduce, have a, have a baby, that's not easy. Brady was in vitro, right? It wasn't easy for Cynthia to get pregnant. And she didn't know, of course, that she had charge syndrome. She knew she was deaf, right? She went to Gallaudet, the deaf college in Washington, D.C., got her graduate degree there. Um, and it's done very, very well. Sometimes you can, you don't know. Connie in, in Netherlands tests all her patients and, and their families and did find one that had a mother who tested positive for the mutation. She had virtually no symptoms other than her balance was off. And I'll talk about balance in a little bit here. So, C-H-A-O-G-E, cute, right? Okay, I gotta do that twice, don't I? Okay, so C is for coloboma. So a coloboma is a missing piece of the eye. It's just a hole, there's no eye there. When the eye forms uh, in utero, it evidently forms from the front and goes around and zips up in the back. So if you've ever had a zipper that had a hole in the, in the zipper because it didn't zip properly, that's kind of like a coloboma of your zipper. <laughs> There's a hole there where it didn't zip entirely right. For that reason, many of the um, colobomas are, appear in the retina, which is, of course, the back of the eye. But it can also be in the iris. So by 80%, these are real guesstimates about how what percentage of the kids have what. But um, it's about 80%. You can't do anything. There's nothing to to build upon, there's just a hole there, it's missing tissue, right? So it's not like you can surgically change that until we get to be able to do whole eye transplants and then that might work. So here's an iris coloboma. And you say it has a keyhole effect. So the bottom part there is, you know, it's just missing, right? Now if you have an iris coloboma, it's not gonna affect your vision. It will affect your light sensitivity because your eyes, pupils not going to contract properly right all the way. So they may have to wear sunglasses when they're outdoors. Typically in charge, if you have an iris coloboma, it also goes all the way through to the retina. But in the general world out there, people can have iris colobomas without going through to the retina. So there's a normal retina. It's actually my son's, my youngest son's retina doesn't have charge. So I'm really proud of that retina. Uh, looks cool, right? And the macula, which is the point of sharpest visions right there, and there's the cranial nerve head over there. So it looks nice. This is, next one is Jacob's retina. And the material just isn't there, right? There's no retina. There's stuff behind it, but there's no retina. Um, and this affects his, the optic nerve ends. So you know, who knows how, how, you can actually have a colobum that goes all the, all the way down the optic nerve, but um, I don't think his does. It does skirt the macula, so he may get some sharp vision, but it wouldn't be complete. In fact, his vision is about this. You know, his right eye is small and it's all coloboma. His left eye, it covers the, the upper visual field, so he can look as and often tips his head back so he can see more straight forward. And he has bad acuity in that eye, but he uses it really well. People say, why, well, he can see. Yeah, that's all he's ever known, but he uses, so he uses what he's got really, really well. Unfortunately, some kids with charge get um, retinal tears, and then it's really hard to tape back together, and if you, if you, you know, have problems with your retina, they can, they can, 
I had with this eye, and they glued it all back down. It was great. But um, there's not much material there, so some of the kids do go completely blind, uh, which is something we worry about all the time. But yeah, so far, not so much. H is for heart malformations. Some of the defects are minor, as I said, Jacob had a little tiny hole. Others are, are complex. They require surgery, as it did in Reuben, who I showed you earlier. Probably 75 to 80 percent of individuals would charge. Heart defects not very diagnostic because so many syndromes have heart problems. So because you got a heart problem, it's not going to be indicative of charge. But it's useful to know that with charge, you do um, often have heart defects. Um, every heart defect that I'm aware of can be impacted in charge. It's not like all of them have tetralogy of Fallot. No, that happens in charge, but they all, all have it. Um, this kid died from pulmonary atresia with collateral arteries, and that's kind of diagram there, but the, the, your pulmonary artery is too small for the, to pump the amount of blood through that's supposed to, so it develops these capillaries that go out and carry the blood to where it needs to go. But those capillaries are thin, and they can run into problems and collapse, and then that's when, the, when you die. Um, found he was living in Sweden and just came home from school and died. And I say that's like, whoa, whoa, it just happened. But it, we do, we do in the charge community have to deal with our kids dying. And it's, it's really hard. There's been a lot of, we have a Facebook page with like 7,000 people on it. Um, and when the kid dies and, you know, it's like we all want to hold each other's hand because we've lost one of ours. And Tommy was a, I knew his parents quite well. I only saw Tommy when he was a little baby like this. He lived in Australia at that time, but then they moved back to Sweden where his mom is from. But we're, we stay in good touch. Family's doing well. Okay, A is for atresia of the coena. So you got that one right. I can move right along. Um, your coena are the passages in the back of your nose that go down to the throat so that you can breathe through your nose. When that's blocked, obviously you can't breathe through your nose. Babies are nose breathers. If babies don't have an airway through their nose, they will suffocate and die. Um, so this is really, really serious at birth. And now they're starting to um, correct it at birth. With Jacob, who had it on both sides, we had to wait a while. They wanted him to get bigger, which didn't happen, so they finally just went ahead and did the correct and correction. Um, the way that we kept him breathing, he took the nipple on a baby bottle and cut the tip so it was wider and taped it in his mouth, and that kept his mouth open and kept him breathing. Of course, people said, you're not supposed to tape a pacifier in a baby's mouth. Said, no, but this one's <laughs> more than a pacifier. This is keeping our kid alive. So we'll do it. And it worked, it worked really well, but sometimes it's these simple little things that somebody dreams up that works for you. So complete blockage is called atresia. Narrowing is called stenosis. Occurs maybe half the individuals with charge. I'll show you a picture of what this looks like, um, x-ray. So the x-ray is looking up from below, looking at the nose, sticking out there at the top. And you can see on one side where it's black from the tip of the nose, it goes back to the throat. Although there's a little bit of a narrowing there. On the left side, it doesn't get all the way back there. So what they have to do is they have to drill through bone or membrane from the back of the throat to create those holes, and which is not easy surgery to do. Then they put stents, plastic stents in to keep it open until it heals. And sometimes kids, have to have it done a second time because as they get older, it, it narrows again. Fortunately, Jacob's has stayed wide open ever since he had it. When we had that surgery back in 89, um, we found two people that had, were experts, one in Chicago and one in Kansas City because they'd already, each one had already done one. So Jacob would be their second. We were living in Wichita, Kansas at the time, although moving to central Michigan, but um, he had it done in Kansas City and very successfully, so that was good. Now, as I say, it's relatively routine. People know how to do this. Our restrictions in growth and development. The kids tend to be short-statured and also have developmental delays. Um, 
Not always, but development delays do occur. Um, lots of reasons for them to be smaller and delayed. Lots of hospital stays. You know, she said, what, Ruben had 13 surgeries? I've known kids with 30 surgeries, right? Lots of time in hospital. Um, the multisensory impairments, when you can't, can't see well or hear well, it's going to affect, affect your development. Uh, hormone deficiencies are common in charges I'll talk about in a moment. And feeding and nutrition problems are very much a pro an issue with charge. So lots of reasons why they may be short, hormonal, or you know, intellectually delayed. This was actually my wife's thesis of her graduate program in school psychology. She had 100 children with charge. Looking at adaptive behavior, we, it's hard to give a kid with charge an IQ test, but adaptive behavior scales are done by the, filled out by the parent or the teacher, and pretty reliable indicators of overall how well this kid functions. Um, and you know, people had said, oh, charge syndrome. They're all cognitive delayed, right? No, she found that there was a much higher range of ability than previously had been thought. And I, I would say the, if you had to pin me down, an average of an IQ of between 80 and 85. Okay, that's just, but it's really hard to pin down because there's so much variability. And just because a kid functions one way in the classroom doesn't mean that's their total capacity. Sometimes things get in the way, like, vision and hearing problems, for example, or balance problems, or teachers who don't get what this kid's all about can also have an impact. Um, it's interesting, those who walked earlier and had fewer medical problems had better scores on adaptive behavior, but most of the differences in adaptive behavior scores were counted for age of walking. And I, age of walking is one of those interesting things that I found in a lot of my research. Um, so I think I have a slide maybe later on, on age of walking, but it's a good marker of how well the kids are going to do. So the G is for genital urinary abnormalities. So very small penis in boys um, and, and un undescended, undescended testicles. Uh, underdeveloped labia can occur in females, although they tell me it's kind of hard to diagnose. I've never tried to do that. Um, delays in puberty occur in both sexes. Going into puberty for a kid with charge is very, very difficult. And a lot of different kinds of urinary tract anomalies are associated with, with charge. Um, so we have to be careful to understand the kidney in charge because those kids who have problems with their kidneys, it tends to be pretty serious. Okay, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Boy, the first time I ever said that to an audience, I stuttered so badly and I said it a second time and got it right. They all applauded. But um, hypogonadism means that the hormones that turn on the gonads, right, your sex organs, basically, it's not enough of it. It's hypo. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is because the gonadotropic releasing hormone is deficient, so it doesn't stimulate the uh, thalamus and pituitary to release the hormones. And basically, the source of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is the development of the nose, which is really fascinating to I me. Mean, kids with charge, by and large, cannot smell or have a very deficient sense of smell. When your nasal buds form about the same time, these hormones that are in that right by the nose travel down the olfactory um, nerve to, I want to say hypothalamus, and then to the pituitary. But in charge, it doesn't develop properly. The nasal buds don't develop properly. The cranial nerves are rarely in the same place that you expect them to be. So what happens is this hormone doesn't get there. So yeah, they have to have testosterone and estrogen supplements to be able to go into puberty and develop um, you know, hair and breasts and that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, and anosmia is a lack of sense of smell, which the French actually identified early on. And, uh, but it's, see, so now you already have vision, hearing, and smell impacted. That's a lot. That's a lot. Okay, ears, e is for ear malformations and hearing loss. 
Um, the next slide, I think, has pictures of some charged ears. They're pretty identifiable by those who really study charged ears. Um, I can do kind of okay. They tend to be a little bit floppy, not much of an ear lobe, but they're also kind of weird shaped. It could be both ears, it could be one ear. Even if it's both ears, they're usually shaped differently. So it's unusual. Genesis think this is crazy because you don't have bilateral kinds of things. It's unilateral, and why is that? You may have a very normally shaped ear, and the other ear is a total mess. Um, you also have varying levels of hearing loss, mild, moderate, severe. Jacobs is profound, no hearing whatsoever. The uh, audiologists at CMU were convinced he had some hearing. Got to wear those hearing aids. Got to wear those hearing aids. You ever hear people wearing hearing aids when they're lying down? They squeak like crazy, but he rarely, rarely got that far. He would just throw them across the room. So we rarely used his hearing aids because we were sure he'd had no hearing. But we always carried them with us because Mount Pleasant is a small community. We see his audiologist somewhere, oops, put the hearing aids in. Hi, Linda, yeah, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> we just lied. It's terrible, <laughs> terrible. Um, but the hearing loss can be difficult to evaluate if your kid doesn't have good communication skills and can tell you. And sometimes, I mean, I hate those hearing tests, right? Because did I hear the buzz? Did I hear the buzz? I don't know if I heard it, didn't hear it. Do I want to be more deaf than I think I am? Or, or, you know, but it's horrible. There's some charge outer ears. And they do vary a bit, but there's some consistency. And I've been told that audiologists can identify charge just on the basis of, the, of the, looking at the ear. Jacob's ear is not that bad. I think, I mean, they're a little low. When we identify they're a little low, we just started singing, do your ears hang low? Good times. As so the age of walking again, and of course these kids are, are crawling. It was really, this was the French conference, and they were just going around and around and around in a, in a, in a chain. Really fun. Related to adaptive behavior, as, as my wife's study showed, you know, the earlier they walk, the better their adaptive behavior. Challenging behavior. You know, the kids who walked earlier don't tend to develop as much challenging behavior. Executive dysfunction, problems with, with uh, controlling your attention and processing from the frontal cortex. Age, early age of walking, less executive dysfunction. Number of psychotropic medications. I found that the earlier they walk, fewer medications they're on. Communication skills. I didn't do that particular research, but one of my colleagues did. Earlier they walked, better their communication. And sleep disturbances as well. So you know, obviously a lot of things are associated with age of walking. The big puzzle has been why age of walking? And there are some, some ideas that we have about that which I can I can share with you. Here's the inner ear anomaly, anatomy, and you see the semicircular canals kind of. But right, the semicircular canals are three of them at the right angles, and they detect balance. They detect where your head is in space. So every time you move your head, what's happening is this gelatinous fluid in your semicircular canal, which is moving when you tip your head, and then stimulates some cells, which tell you ultimately um, what, where your head is in space. Also, it turns out that the semicircular canals are very much involved in ocular coordination. That's your coordinating of your eyes. So if you look at somebody and then turn your head, you can still look at them. That's determined by your semicircular canals. Um, if, you, if you can't do that and you, your eyes go with your head, then it's often very difficult to come back and find out where was I before. I think this is one of the big reasons why the kids are, are highly affected. Those, because most of our kids don't have good semicircular canals. They're either absent or they're malformed. And so they're walking like this when they're able to walk. One parent said, yeah, my kid walks like a drunken sailor. And yeah, that's how they, that's how they do it. Um, when they learn to walk, you know, Jacob was seven when he learned to walk. I've known a kid who was 12 when they learned to walk. I've known a kid who was two when they learn to walk. The average age of walking for charge is just after having turned three, somewhere in the next few months. Average, but that doesn't mean a lot in charge because they're so highly variable. Um, so when your eyes, so see, even if you didn't have coloboma, even if you didn't have those or it was very, very small, you still your eyes aren't functioning normally. It's very hard if, if you know, you're in a classroom watching the teacher 
and someone makes a disturbance and you look away, you can't get back to the teacher. I had one old, young adult with charge who said, so that's why I work on some, some uh, welding stuff and when I got pipes, I can't always keep them straight as to where they are, right? Because they keep kind of shifting on me. That's because your eyes are shifting. And he was really happy to find out what the problem was and he could comp learn to compensate for it. But that's, that's a big issue. We've also recently discovered the cerebellum is affected in these some kids with charge. And within the cerebellum, we have movement is a big part of what the cerebellum is involved in. That's the ataxia. Your gait, um, kinetic, and speech can all be affected. And so I, I'm pretty darn sure, because for, for the, cere for the semitor canals is where your head is, for um, the cerebellum, it's, it's the movement, you know, forward, backwards kind of thing. Semester canals is up and down, but um, the cerebellum is huge in terms of just your overall gait. So maybe the drunken satyr is not just because I'm having a hard time getting balanced, but it's also because of uh, just the cerebellum problems have affected that. We've, there's some preliminary research that's been done, um, and I... I have to check and see where they are because I haven't seen anything published yet, but I think this is going to be a big issue as we get to know more about the brain in charge. Language development. See, language is based on vision and mobility. Well, if your vision doesn't work well and it's hard to be mobile, especially when you're a kid crawling around on your back, many of the kids crawl on their back, um, it's a problem. Hearing loss, a problem. Tracheostomy, if, because it's a hole in your throat, kind of influence speech. You can, they often have a cap on it, so you close the cap and you can hear the kid speak, but you've got to open it up so the kid can breathe. Um, craniofacial problems, so some of the kids have the coenal atresia, some of them have a cleft palate, and so there are a number of different craniofacial kinds of features that may be affected, will affect language. Early language stimulation, if a kid's deaf, how do you stimulate their language? Well, we use sign, but what if you don't sign? And even if you sign, does everybody in their environment sign? So to get that kind of a rich signing environment, it's very difficult to create. Cognitive skills, some of these kids are, are much lower, and that's going to influence communication. Parent-child interactions, did a study on attachment and charge, and about 25% of the parents were struggling with feeling like they were attaching to their child. Um, and then the various neurological kinds of features that we're, we're just really in the process of identifying in charge. Um, all of this affects communication. The kids learn to use different forms um, and really need a whole language approach. So here's one study looking at the communication skills. So you can see about 16% just made reactions or noises to behaviors or behaviors to communicate. Uh, almost 10% use behaviors such as gestures, sounds, body movements. 12% got to single words or signs or picture symbols or object symbols. Then you got almost 14% using two to five word phrases, sentences, and then almost 50% actually use verbal or sign language to complete sentences. It's fun to go to a conference and see these kids with charge signing. Um, and I don't sign, I'm so embarrassed, but I don't sign. I, I remember the alphabet some days, and then I still confuse those up. My wife took five sign language classes, so she can sign. But there's some of the kids will come up to you and they'll start signing. I go, I'm oh, sorry. But they keep signing because they, they want something from you. Um, Jacob, it's really kind of the second one there. Gestures, sounds. Well, actually, he's into the next one, too, because he's got single signs. So he's got Jacob signs. And he's got about 15 or 20 of those that he uses occasionally and that he re recognizes from other people. He uses picture symbols a lot. So here's my picture that says I want to have chocolate pudding. Or here's the picture that says I want to go to Target and play with stuff in Target. Uh, so he, he does, does some of that. But so you can't stop them from some, there's some people who think, oh, no, no, don't confuse them with different systems. No, you've got to bring in every system and help the kid develop a combination of those in order to, to be able to communicate. Okay, the B in charge. 
Most of you are clever enough to know there's no B in charge, but behavior ought to be in charge because it's so common for the kids to have severe behavioral issues. I wasn't aware of that because Jacob never really developed what I would consider significant behavioral issues. Other people might think differently, but you know, all our kids are a little messed up. But, um, but I went, remember I was at a conference and I was, they put me on a panel. This was in Australia in Sydney. And uh, I was with a pediatrician and my wife was on the panel and I was on the panel to respond to parents' questions about behavior. And my jaw just hit the table because I had no idea that kids were behaving that badly, aggressively, um, and as well as nearly any kind of negative behavior you can think of, some kid with charge does it. Some of it's kind of cute. There's one kid that liked to put things down air vents, you know, for your, your uh, heating system or air conditioning system and stick them down there. Um, cool, but the dad had to unscrew it right and reach down and try to retrieve as much as he, much as he could. Uh, that's not a problem, that's a problem. So is there B in charge? So I said in the 1990s, parents were talking about the unusual behaviors. Many are getting diagnosed with autism, obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD, tick disorder. I have a problem with this diagnosis stuff, especially the autism. Kids with charge do not have autism. And some people say, well, Tim, statistically they could. Eh, I don't, I don't agree. <clears throat> they can have autistic-like behaviors but if you're deaf blind, <coughs> you're going to show some weird behaviors, right? And how does it help, even if they say they're autistic? What does it tell you what to do? Not really, right? Because it's not all of who they are. You've got all these other issues you've got to deal with. So I find it, I'd rather try to figure out what is charge behavior? Not autistic, not OCD. Charge behavior. And is there a charge behavioral phenotype? Um, I've thought a lot about that. So that's just like with Prater Welly, you know the kids gorge food. That's part of the behavioral phenotype. You can't modify that. The only thing you can do to keep Prater Welly kids from eating is lock it up and hide the keys. Um, is there something like that for charge? I don't really think so, but I did develop a behavioral phenotype. Here are just some of the, some of the kinds of behaviors you might see. Um, you know, finger flicking, well, if you don't see much, it's great to have a light and finger flick through the light because the light's reflecting on my, my fingers into my eyes and it's very stimulating. Why not? But that's something people can get concerned about. Um, stops what they're doing and touches the ground repeatedly. That's kind of a fun one. That sounds like OCD, doesn't it? Maybe also it started with an interest in figuring out where the ground is. Right, because I'm having a hard time kind of tracking that or feeling it in my body. We'll talk about proprioceptive problems in a moment. I won't go through all of these, but, but knocks on walls, grinds teeth, slaps knees, grunts. Violent fits, that's a problem. Um, spins in circles, Jacob enjoys that one a lot. Skin picking, uh, empty containers and drawers. Yeah, I don't think I wrote that one for Jacob, he does. His caregivers will hear him, uh-oh, he just opened his dresser drawer, and then by the time they get in there, most of the stuff is out of it. But they say, Jacob, put it back. <sighs> he puts it all back, so it's not so bad. But it's really fun to see all of these and ask ourselves, how does that help them? You know, why do they do that? Why, how, why do they choose this behavior over a different behavior? I'm not just about automatically getting rid of it. I want to know why a kid would choose that behavior. So here's <laughs> the big three. Um, this kind of evolved over a six month period probably out of my research lab, kind of putting together a model of understanding behavior in charge. My, my graduate students like to go around going like this, triangle, I, I can do that, makes them laugh. I'm not sure why, but it does make them laugh. So I was thinking like there are kind of at least these three major issues that I think are a result in some of the behavior that we see with charge. And I've for years told parents, check out the pain first. Because if somebody's in pain, their behavior is not going to be appropriate very often, right? I mean, how do you act when you're in pain? Oh, I'm OK. Yeah, life's great. No, you, you probably become a basket case. The sensory issues. What's it, you know, if your brain 
your brain sits in your skull, right? If there was no sensory input, none of your sensory systems worked at all, what can the brain do? Nothing. So with our kids charged their diminished sensory input, that's going to affect stuff. And then anxiety. Imagine living in a world where it was very hard to predict what was going to happen next. All right, so I'm going to go actually a little bit more on each of these. Oh, and the self-regulation in the middle. That's what we need to do, tell, teach these kids how to self-regulate. Most of you learned how to self-regulate by naturally growing up, seeing models of, of self-regulation, being disciplined by your parents, and just kind of figuring out, this is how I deal with my emotions. This is how I control my thoughts and motivation. You know, these are all the different things that I do. Our kids don't, with charge don't learn those automatically. They have to be taught. So why is pain so important? Well, pain can affect normal brain and neurological development. You know, all those pathways aren't completely understood, but we know that this happens, and our kids are experiencing how many surgeries often in the first four years? These kids know pain. In fact, they know pain to such an extent that I think they become kind of acclimated to it. I've heard people say, oh, these kids have a high pain threshold. You have to really hurt them before they notice it. No, 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 no. Before they respond to it, because they're so used to it. You know, as you get older, you'll discover you've got aches and pains in different places. You just live with it, right? You deal with it. You don't even think about it any much anymore. But it's still affecting you. It's still making you less comfortable than you would like to be. Uh, certainly pain can affect sleep, as most of you know. And sleep's a huge problem in charge anyway. And how's your behavior after having not, had not a night of good sleep, right? It's bad. Can interfere with exploration of the environment and learning. If I'm in pain, how much do I want to go out there and explore, right? Not at all. You know, for the development of attachment and trust. How do I trust a world where every time they come to see me, they do something that hurts me? You know, before Jacob has surgery, we show him a surgical mask, which Nancy swiped from the hospital one time. And it scares the bejesus out of him, but um, at least he knows, right? We want him to be prepared. We don't want him to suddenly, you're holding him down and you're taking his clothes. No, he needs to be prepared. But know there's going to be pain involved. Um, once tolerated, can be ignored. That's what I'm saying, even when it's affecting health and behavior. And it's communicated through behavior. We'll get a call from next door at Jacob's house, and the caregiver will say, Jacob's showing those pain behaviors. And I'm not sure I can even describe them that well all the time, but we know them when we see them. I mean, something can be described. He'll stick things in his neck and go like that. He'll walk around the house and turn on water faucets and put his hand underneath it. That's, that tends to be pain. So they, they know what kinds of things to look at. And as they get to know Jacob, they can tell Jacob's not feeling good. So as I'm saying, so much of the behavior that we see may start out as pain behaviors, but then it gets turned into something else by the way we respond to it or don't respond to it. Sensory deficits. I've talked about hearing, vision, and smell. Taste is affected by smell, so these kids have a diminished taste. Some of them really like really strong taste. Tactile, these kids tend to be very hypersensitive to touch on their skin, especially palms of hands and the, and the bottoms of feet. Walking across grass can be extremely painful to them because it just hurts, it literally hurts. Um, there are ways that occupational therapists have developed to help reduce the sensory. Uh, overload there, but it's, it's hard. I mentioned the balance issues. Also proprioceptive. So proprioceptive is your awareness of where your body is. So if I said, okay, wiggle your left big toe, guys can find your big left toe. But a kid with charge, I say, where's your left foot? They might have to go, it's right there. Okay, they found it. Right? It's, proprioceptions are really one of these really weird things, but extremely important for our functioning all the time. We have to know where we're going, right? We have to know where our body is situated uh, and to feel our body, feel it from the top of the head down to the bottom of the toes. Um, where is it? What's it doing? And that's very much diminished in charge. So here's a kid who's watching TV. And it looks bizarre, but his whole body is along the couch here 
So he's getting lots of proprioceptive feedback as to where his body is, especially lying on his back pressed against the couch. Um, he's got colobomas wearing significant glasses. As I said, upper visual field is blocked. So if I'm got my head tipped back, I'm watching the TV much more easily. Also, how much muscular work do we have to do to keep our head upright? We don't think about that much. But when your head is hanging upside down, nothing. It's stable. And for the kids with, <laughs> other vestibular, with the vestibular problems, their head is really stable because they can't, they don't really know where it is because they can't control that balance sense. So this kid's figured it out, right? This works for me. In fact, hanging upside down is one of those really characteristic charge uh, behaviors. I just asked parents to send me pictures of the kid hanging upside down. I think the next day I had 80 pictures, which I couldn't use all of them. But uh, very, very common in charge that they hang upside down because it works for them. Now, they don't hang for a long time, right? One parent said, if my daughter's doing well, it would be 10 minutes. If she's been having some problems, it could be 20 minutes. And then, then they're done. That's just like their way of relaxing. Maybe not mine, but... Then anxiety. Anxiety is uncertainty about what's going to happen next. You know, if you're deafblind, you know what happens to you? You might be lying on your bed. Someone comes in, gets you up, and they're taking you somewhere. Where are we going? Are we going five minutes to the grocery store? Are we going 10 hours to Grandma's house? What's happening? What's happening? That's why we show Jacob the, the surgical mask. Oftentimes, they really don't know what's happening. And they go to school. And the teacher says, OK, we're going to start out with math. Oh, I didn't know we were going to start out with math. I thought we were going to start out with social studies. They can go into a panic about something like that. One parent told me that her, she was taking her kid to the doctor, and her kid started pounding on her back while she was driving. He was sitting behind her. What's going on? Well, the doctor's office had moved to a new location farther down the road. And they were driving by where the doctor's office was. This is wrong. We need to stop here. We're, you're taking me to the doctor's office. He couldn't communicate. He couldn't speak. But he sure could pound her back. She pretty much had to pull over and try again to explain that the doctor's office was, I think they actually had to get out of the car and go up, see it was locked, and get back in the car before he was OK to go on. Um, so we need to figure out ways to help kids with charge to understand what's happening. There's a whole system of calendar uh, calendars that you can create for kids, which are visual calendars. You can have them on Velcro so you can show how the sequence of the day is going to be. You can take them off and put them in the finish box as the day progresses. You can go back over the days. Remember, we did this, and then we did this, and then we did this. So it also establishes better communication. But one of the pieces of advice I give people working with kids with charges, go slowly. Give them lots of warning. Um, Alexis, the girl that was in one of the earlier photos that I said had passed away, um, her school, she went in early and watched TV until about 20 minutes or 25 minutes later they could start school. You had to tell her, 10 minutes, Alexis, 10 minutes, Alexis, 5 minutes, 3 minutes, 2 minutes, right, before she was willing to transition to the next activity. So kids need to feel safe for them to perform for them to behave appropriately. If you don't know what's happening, you're not going to feel safe. So here's kind of my charge behavioral phenotype. Um, low normal cognitive functioning, that's not a surprise at this point. Very goal-directed. Kids with charge are highly, highly goal-directed. If they're going to do something, they will do it, and they'll figure out a way to do it, which is good. That's why they think they learn how to walk. But it's bad because if parents don't want them to do something, it can be a problem. Um, but they are funny. Oh my gosh, they're funny. Socially interested. They are very socially interested. And they may go up to you and say, Hi, what's your name? What's the color of your house? What's the color of your car? I think they've had a really nice conversation with somebody. It's weird. They get too close. They don't know what they're doing. But again, they don't have a lot of role models for this. They can't see how other people do it. They've been taught you need to talk to people. And so they're doing the best that they can. Um, Repetitive behaviors, which increase under stress. Repetitive behaviors can be ticks. They can be, uh, like I said, tapping the floor, stomping your foot. Um, lots of different things that people do over and over and over again, even the light flicking thing I illustrated before. Um, you can kind of measure how stressed the person is by how much they're, they may be engaging in it. 
High levels of sensation seeking, it takes so much to get something into the brain, they may spend a lot of time trying to get more stuff in by touching things. Jacob, who was in kindergarten, licked the entire circumference of his room, right? Because the best sense he had. Um, yeah, I know. I said, but he's, he, he didn't die. So <laughs> turns out you can lick rooms and not die. Um, under conditions of stress and sensory overload, find it difficult to self-regulate and lose control. So stress is a problem. Sensory overload is a problem. You see, at the same time they're trying to get sensory stimulation in, sometimes they get too much because they can't regulate it so well. At that point, they lose all control, and it's really bad. Um, difficulty with shifting attention, moving to new activities, easy lost in their own thoughts. That's that transition thing is so tough, so difficult. And the executive, this is a kind of executive function tasks, but really difficult for kids with charge to engage in. So I don't know. I wrote this like in an hour one day. I'm going to come. Behavioral phenotype is it down the road. It's hardly been modified since. They used to say first draft at the top, but I realized this, there's not going to be a second draft, so I might as well just keep it as it is. Parents say, oh my God, that's my kid. So that gives me some comfort. Is it really a phenotype? I don't know. I don't know. But it describes charge behavior reasonably well. I'd like to give thanks to my lab there. It's hard to find one of all the current people because it keeps changing, but this was actually in Australia with all their, their charge shirts on, and there are their names. Um, we have a website, we have a Facebook page, almost have a thousand likes on it, so you could put us over at the top if you search for the Charge Center um, Research Lab on Facebook. So, questions. There's a lot of stuff that I've covered here, but all of it can't have been clear, or some of it may have made you interested. Yes? Yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting study. It was done by one of my McNair students, his undergraduate. And we tried to simulate, you know, the basic strange situation that would typically be used by asking parents to identify how the kid responds in different kinds of situations. And then we had a bonding scale, which I can't remember now what that's, what's on that scale. So it was, it was survey. We can't get, you know, population of kids in one place that we, very easily that we could actually study it in, in, in a laboratory kind of situation. So I've always wondered, like, do you just as a parent attach and bond more? Or I thought you were saying that less. It's, it's less. you know, what, what causes you to bond with your kid? Well, they look at you, right? They respond to you uniquely. And you can predict what the responses are going to be. Kids with charge, the responses can be all over the map. So understanding that, no, for example, with the colobomas, I may be looking at you when I appear to be looking over there and the parent doesn't know I'm looking at you. So the parent gets this idea, oh my God, you don't love me, you know, you don't care about me, and that's, that's the problem. Do you think there'd be a goodness of fit issue as well? So oh, absolutely, oh my gosh. There aren't things that, that you're similar at, so you, you can't share in the same way with as part of that whole bonding process. Now, if you think about goodness of fit, and some parents are looking for the kid to be functioning up here, and so they're missing the kid entirely. And the kid's got blockages because of the sensory impairments, so even for them to engage with the parent, it's very, very difficult. How do you take a parent and help them become a good fit for their kid? That's a challenge. Um, you know, I've seen amazing parents. I've seen parents that just struggle. So figuring that out, huge, huge issue. Uh, yeah, right. Um, how, where would you go in like the West Michigan area to get tested for, for like test a child for that? Is there any place you can go? I honestly don't know. I mean, there are laboratories around the country that routinely test for CHD7. I think you can look, I think you can Google it and find out where they are. Certainly Baylor does it still. Um, actually, Baylor sent us our results and Jacob did not show the mutation. I was at a conference, we got the letter from Baylor. They'd taken blood in 99 from families who were attending a conference in Houston. And it doesn't have the mutation. I go, oh my gosh, no, he must. I went to one person and said, Tim, you're going to have to resign from the foundation and, and retract all your publications. 
And I wanted to, that wasn't helpful. I wanted to know they said, well, he's still got charge because it's a clinical diagnosis. That really wasn't helpful. I went to Connie, who found the gene. She said, send me his DNA. I'll test it. I'll call it research. It didn't cost me a dime other than to mail it over there. And the mutation was obvious. Um, it was so he had it. But so different labs can be unreliable, too. But they're so much better now than they used to be. Sure. But you'd have to talk to a geneticist or a genetic counselor to find out where they would refer somebody. Yes? Can Charlie be diagnosed pre-birth? And if it can, can you kind of guess how severe it is in birth of it? Can it be tested in vitro? Yes, it can. Um, but you'd have to have a reason for wanting to do that test, which is unusual unless you already had a kid with charge or you had charge. Why would you, why would you do that testing? In a, in a level two ultrasound, they would look for excess amniotic fluid. So my wife had, um, so she got really big and then went in premature labor because when they have coagulant trees, you're not processing through the body the amniotic fluid and it just builds up. You can look at kidneys, you can look at heart. So certain things like that you can, you can check, but it def nothing will give you a diagnosis, just a suspicion that there's something wrong. Sorry, yeah, sure. Um, do you see any cases of um, seizures? So any, any case of? Connections with seizures? Neurological seizures? Are there any connections? Seizures. You see? Seizures, I'm sorry. Hearing impairment. <laughs> um, some kids, especially when they get around 19, 20, have developed a seizure disorder. I'm not sure that that's charge related or not. We know so little about the brain in charge. We've not really had a neurologist who so far has been passionate about charge. Okay. Um, we certainly have neurologists who treat kids with charge, but that doesn't mean they know what they're talking, you know, what they're really dealing with. So I would say there's some suspicion that some kids with charge when they get into young adulthood um, maybe tendency towards seizure disorder. I just don't know at this point how common it is. But really great question. There was another one over here. Yes. I know you say it's not genetically, um, but and you said it comes from the sperm implantation. Mm -hmm. But if a woman, like the girl, she had it and she had a kid with charge, why is she a higher risk if it's not from, she, she, she didn't know that it was a sperm, it's a guy. Right, so she inherited it. I mean, I mean she got it from a de novo mutation. So, you know, your parents didn't have it, but you just got the, the lousy ticket, right? And so you got, you had got charged okay. because of your father's sperm mutation. But now, if you can reproduce and have a kid yourself, it goes through the typical kind of genetic probabilities that 50% chance of having, a, it's a dominant gene, that's, that's so 50% chance of having a kid with charge. And then that kid would also have the gene and they'd have a 50% chance. It's, but most of the kids, because of the puberty problems, don't end up being fertile enough to be able to have a, have a baby, so it, it doesn't happen. Now, if you have a very, very mild case, there's a girl here in Grand Rapids who's got a very, very mild case. She's very high functioning, um, went to college and all that stuff, but, and she's on Facebook all the time. <laughs> um, but she probably could have a kid. She didn't have the puberty kinds of issues. Yeah, that's such a, such a great question because this autism thing gets in the way, they say, because of their weird behaviors. You know, they self-stim, they don't have good communication skills, right? They, they don't, aren't terribly social, but they are so bloody social. That's the thing that gets missed. And these kids who've been to conferences for years, have known each other since they were babies even, see each other every two years, if not before, for, for a conference, whatever country they're in, if they have a conference. And they're, they're, they're very, very close. They hang out. They have this marvelous time together. And I see that occasionally we get a family who will come up to our charge lab just for us to do kind of an assessment. And when you see these kids crawling onto my students' laps and hugging them, that's not autism. I'm sorry. Yeah, their behavior is really weird. And you can go through the DSM and check off, yeah, yep, yep, they got... No, they don't have autism. It's something very different. So they are highly motivated socially for the most part. My son isn't so much. If you want to diagnose him with autism, I'll be mad at you. But I could, it's a better fit than for most of the kids because um, they are so highly social. 
They just don't do it well. They mess it up. Yeah? How are they academically? Like, academically is all over the map. As I say, there's college graduates all over the place who've got charge, master's degrees. Um, Jacob with just a certificate of attendance he got through there. I have found that if you talk, think, I hate to even talk about typical charge because it's really hard to define, but they can do all right in school until about third grade and they start falling behind. What happens in the third grade? The work becomes much less rote learning and memory and much more conceptual and abstract. So they can work really, really hard to memorize stuff. And they have amazing memory. You could, if Jacob had come with me here today and probably crawling around down here somewhere, and then when we came back a year later, he would go right to the same spot because he he's got the visual memory thing. But that doesn't help with, you know, what's democracy, what's the sunset. I mean, those kinds of things are very difficult to try to teach. So, but they can be taught. We just have to have really skilled teachers who get the problems in charge and understand how to modify the curriculum, adapt the curriculum so that that you can compensate for some of the difficulties the kids are going to be encountering. So, really nice question. What else? This is fun. Yeah? Are there differences in diagnosis between, like, as far as amounts between genders? No, it's pretty much 50-50, males, females. Um, it's one of the things you look for, especially to see whether it might be a sex-linked chromosome or gene, and it's not. It's eighth chromosome. It's um, now, males and females are pretty much, and, and worldwide, I mean, some places don't do as much with charge because it's, you know, I get emails from people from all over the world, um, Arabic countries and Asian countries, and one family from Indonesia contacts me fairly often about the progress on their kid. They don't have a lot of people there, but that's because they're not identified. Years ago in Canada, they did a census of charge, and all the provinces except Alberta had kids, had cases. But that was the one province where the ex Canadian expert had never gone to do a presentation, right? So they didn't know about it. So I think it's pretty evenly distributed. Yeah. I have one more question. Um, how do they, uh, like, how do they react when they see like other kids with the same characteristics? Oh, that's such a good question. How do they react when they see other kids with the same syndrome? Actually, the Australians were clever, and they did a book for kids about why I am me, which takes them through their whole all the charge characteristics and the th experiences that kids with charge have to help kids to understand what it is that they have. Some kids hate charge, that have charge. Everyone can, I hate charge syndrome, I stomped out of a room. I can hardly blame them for that. Um, but they also, many of the kids recognize, and maybe the parents influence this, because when we see other families with a kid with charge, this is magnificent. You now these are our new best friends because um, we have this amazing thing in common with charge. Maybe the kids pick up on that and there's kind of natural social thing and here's somebody who knows something about my experience. One of the issues that comes up over and over again with the adolescents in particular is I'm more than charge. I do something people say, oh that must be charge. And just imagine every time you did something someone says, oh that's because you have this diagnosis. No, I'm a human being first. Charge is only a part of what I have. And that's so important, and we really try to emphasize that with the kids when, well, one of my former students does groups with the adolescents to talk about things like sex and, you know, everything else, social stuff. Um, help them see, no, it's, I'm, I'm more than just a charger. We use that as a term, charger. We don't use it professionally, but informally. Oh, he's a charger, she's a charger. Um, yeah, because we don't want them to think that's all that they are. That would, that's not, that's not, it's not who they are. So that's important. So I, I might not want to associate with somebody else with charge because I don't want that to be my kind of identification. A great question. What else? I've answered everything. Okay, well, very cool. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad you came. Hope you learned something.